Conrad, I'm going to unmute you. Hello, how are you? Good, we can hear you, and I'm going to show your video. We should be good to go. I'll be here if you need anything. Wonderful. Um, I should be in the list of participants twice, because I have a two-camera setup here. There's one that where you should see my face if you want to for some reason, and the other where you should be able to see my hand. Sure. Shall I spotlight your uh, tabletop video? Yes, if you can, please. Wonderful. How's that? That is wonderful. I have these pencils to help me figure out where my limitations are. Perfect. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you folks have taken the time to join me on a Sunday afternoon. I think that a lot of us have maybe encountered um, an insect specimen, a cool bug that we found while out doing a nature program or even around our houses that we think would be great to show to students or to use in outdoor programming. But unfortunately, all the, a lot of the time when we find dead insects, they're always shriveled up and dead in some kind of horrible tortured position with their legs all curled in and their wings all bent in weird positions. And wouldn't it be nice if there was some way to get the insect from that stage of when it's all curled up to a nice, beautiful museum quality specimen. There sure are a bunch of ways that we can do that. And I'll share with you today a few of the techniques that I've come to, to like to use over years of being psychotically obsessed with insects and insect collection. The first thing we can do is make our own insect pinning board. They have commercial pinning boards like, um, like this one, if you look at my my face camera here. They have these fancy adjustable pinning boards with uh, little like uh, wing nuts on the end where you can move them in and out and um, you could mount like uh, something gigantic like a praying mantis or um, you know a dragonfly on one of these. They have these angled boards that aren't totally flat across so they have your specimen will have a, a kind of a um, its wings won't be totally 180 degrees across if you were to use this kind of board. So I don't really gravitate to this a lot. I like my bugs, especially butterflies and moths, to have their wings totally flat across. And the other one that's commercially available is just a, a chunk of foam like this. And so it has a groove down the middle. And so you can see that the insect's body will fit in that groove and its wings will go to either side. But you don't need these sorts of things. All you need is some old cardboard. You can just cut it into three pieces like this and then with two of those pieces cut some holes through the middle. Just like that. About as big as your insect's body is going to be. Those holes will line up to make a nice little groove for you and then the third piece of cardboard will be the backing and that will give you something to pin the insect in and the, that last piece of cardboard will be the, the bottom so that your insect pin has something to stick to so that it doesn't flop around inside that little trench that you've made. I'll see one and that's all put together here. And the next thing we'll need is our insect as far as pinning. We'll get into how to rehydrate them and all that, all that fun stuff later. But we'll get to the most exciting part right away, which is our insect. So I have this moth. Here we go. Here's our moth. Lovely little guy. Let's give you some light. How's that? So the first thing we need to do is to get a pin right through the middle of the moth right through the thorax if you're keeping score at home. So all you need to do, you can avoid grabbing the wing directly by the side, but it's okay if you touch the wings on the, on the underside on a moth, that's okay. That won't do too much damage. And you can certainly handle them by the legs. So you can pick them up gently by the legs and then get, get your pin here and put it right through the middle of the thorax, the second body segment 
the one behind the head there. And gently get it through there. And you want to leave a little bit of the pin sticking up over the top of the insect's back so that you can still handle it later when it's all dried. So you'll take that whole unit and drive it right into your homemade insect pin board. Wonderful. Just like so. Wonderful. And now, see this one's shell will go like this. Give us a little more space. Okay. And then we will need some very small strips of wax paper. You don't want to use any sort of rough paper with a nice, with a strong material that will rub the scales off of your moth or butterfly's wings. So we'll get two little pieces of wax paper just like this that are ripped to size. And then we will use more insect pins to fasten those in place. Don't worry, we'll be stopping for questions later. So we'll position our wax paper on either side. We'll start with this right side here. And then you can use the pins as little tools to manipulate the wings. You can pull the wing forward a little bit if you want from the back, being of course very careful not to disturb or to scrape off those beautiful scales. Moving that wing forward takes a bit of patience, especially with a smaller moth like this. Once it starts to move, there we go. Slowly get it into position like so. So it's starting to rotate the insect's body. That's OK. That's OK. It just didn't want to come out of position very easily. And then once you have your insect's wing roughly where you want it. I have to figure it out. It doesn't really have sound. You can nail it down. And then you can do the other side exactly the same way. Gently put the wax paper over the top. And then use more insect pins as your little tools to move the wings into position. That one's much more cooperative. Beautiful. And then you just, oop, I know my hand's over everything. There you go. And you nail it down. So the insect is in position. But, and you see it's not, the, the body of the insect isn't in line with the rest of the, the hole that we've made for its body to sit in. But that's totally fine. What really is going to matter in the end is that those wings are flat across, perpendicular to the insect's body. That's the most important part. For super extra bonus points, if you want, you can use more pins to position those antennae. This one has one curled antenna the way that it is right now. You can just use those pins to stick into the side of your little trench there. So that those antennae, and sometimes as an insect dries, the antenna will move or curl with moths, they'll tend to curl or with butterflies, sometimes they'll sag or move somewhere that's not the most attractive. And so if you just put a pin next to each one so that it can't curl, you're in great shape. You're in great shape. So I'll stop here for our first 
questions break because I just zipped through a whole bunch of stuff. And I wonder if anyone has any questions about anything that we've seen so far. I just want to add that all participants are muted right now. So if you'd like to jump in with a question, uh, please unmute yourself. Or if you type it into the chat, uh, I can relay it to Conrad. Yes, thank you for that reminder. Well, if we get a bunch of questions pouring in, please feel free to let me know. But of course, in order to even get to this stage, we're gonna have to get our insect from its curled up, horrible, dried up position to a nice malleable, um, rehydrated position. So in order to do that, we will use what we call in the business a relaxing chamber. A relaxing chamber, Move our little specimen here just for now. Like this. Relaxing chamber looks like this when it's all said and done. This is a, a lettuce container with a tofu container inside. Open it up for you. And so here's our tofu container right here. The liquid in there is about 75% vinegar and 25% water. So it's a pretty strong vinegar solution. What that's gonna do is keep down the mold and a dermestid beetles that might be hiding inside your insect specimen. Once you put an insect in this kind of rehydration environment, the first thing that's going to want to happen, being full of, of fungus spores and lots of eggs and larvae of tiny little other creatures, is it's going to want to decompose. So to keep that from happening on you, you have a mix of 75% uh, just white vinegar or any kind of vinegar that you have around the house and 25% water. And then the my little tofu container here is a little boat for the dry insect to sit inside. So you can leave it and see, and it should have a lid on it so that you can leave it sealed up in a, a place away from direct sunlight. You don't want it to get really, really hot either. That could also ruin your specimen. And Conrad, we did have a, a couple questions pop in. Can you, yeah. before you uh, stick our bug in there, can you speak to uh, how hydrated or dry the moth was uh, to begin with? Was it as you found it or have you hydrated him already? This moth is one that I found fresh, one that I found that was alive. But unfortunately, it was too cold over the last couple of days where I am out here in Western New York and the nights to, uh, to find some, uh, some fresh specimens. So we found this one just the other day. We have, um, I've used this rehydration technique to rehydrate insects that have been dead and dry for 20 years. There was a giant Cecropia moth that I rehydrated once that was in somebody's classroom for over 20 years. So it's, it's amazing how absorbent the chitin is in an in insect's exoskeleton. It'll absorb water, even water vapor, over um, a 24-hour or 48-hour period to really become much more malleable, exactly as, as malleable as the, the moth that we saw earlier. And what is the safest way to pick it up and transport it once you've identified a potential specimen? Great question. I have always just been comfortable using my fingers to pick it up by some hind legs or some uh, or just by its body if it's a large insect. I tend to of course avoid holding it by the wings but if you really want to go the extra mile you can invest in some forceps that would look like this or like this. Some of them are are curved and some of them are are flat. Some of them have uh, textured spoons and some of them have smooth spoons. And that takes out any chance that oils or, or different kinds of uh, chemicals or lotions that we have on our fingers would affect our specimen or absorb into the chitin or, or rub off scales or anything. 
So if you really want to go the extra mile, you can invest in those. And then you can put it into a tiny container if you want to protect it. Or I've driven home with a really cool bug just, you know, on my dashboard and taking it slow on the turns. So it's once you get it home, though, getting it into this relaxing chamber is going to be the key. As long as it's protected on the way from getting bumped or squeezed or crushed or broken, you should be in great shape. Oh, and then I see there's another question from Joe. This moth has not been dead for very long at all. But like I say, I've rehydrated and, and re, what did you say? Oh, I've relaxed insects that have been dead for many, many years using this technique here. It could be even some insects that I've found, the, you know, everyone's seen a, a cool bug all shriveled up on their, um, on their car dashboard or in that little spot on the, the rear windshield that you all can't get to and there's like a cool insect and you want to get to it, you can use forceps or an insect pin to get it out of there. You could rehydrate it even if it's been in there for many years. Were there any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, it must have taken just a little bit for everyone to type that in. I moved on too quickly. But once you have your insects safely at home or at your place of work, you can uh, put it into this wonderful relaxing chamber and leave it there for 24 to 48 hours, depending on the size of the insect. Something like uh, a large dragonfly or a praying mantis would take a, a very long time, I would say. It, I would give it at least three days and then once it's in there, you can open up the chamber and use some insect pins or your, or your forceps to just push the, the wings and see if they move to the extent that you want them to. You don't want to push them too far and break them at the base. You can just manipulate the motion of the wing so that it rotates in a nice uh, extent so that it gets to the position that it wants to be when it's finally finished. It's finally finished there. Were there any questions about the relaxing chamber? Of course, if you drop them in the chat, they can let me know and I can revisit it at any time. Yes, those are excellent questions. Oh, how long in the chamber? It depends on the size of the insect. Something like um, a praying mantis or a large dragonfly, I would say, you know, three days at least. And then just go back and keep checking it and opening up the chamber, checking it, and then uh, going back, if it needs more time, just seal it back up and keep it in the chamber longer. And that chitin will eventually absorb enough of that uh, vinegar and water mixture to get it to the relaxed point that you want it to be. I always rehydrated my bugs by putting them in the freezer for a bit. That is a way that a lot of insect collectors will do it. There's sometimes uh, an issue where the, the, the freezer won't get enough moisture into the chitin to relax it to the point that you want it to be. Sometimes an insect that's been recently dead or that's only been uh, dehydrated for say a couple weeks, that would, that's a, a wonderful way to do it. Just put it in a little container, pop it in the freezer and take it out and that thawing action will put enough moisture in the insect's exoskeleton to get it to rehydrate. But if your insect's been dead for a few years, maybe that won't be enough. Or if it's a very large insect, that could also be another complication there. But yeah, the, the freezer technique is excellent. This is just a, another technique that I prefer because it's, it works for all bugs and I just use it for every single insect. I don't have to go between two different techniques. But yes, the freezer technique does certainly work. And then what do you check to know how it's done? Malleable legs, exactly, malleable legs. The wings are the most important things, especially with a moth, like we saw earlier, which we'll revisit. They will, the, as long as the wings will come forward far enough to be where you want them for a nice scientific display, then you're in business. Sometimes the legs will just be so, so difficult to get to underneath the wings that you won't even want to mess with them and try to reposition them. With something like a praying mantis or a large dragonfly or say a giant water bug, there you have those giant 
front legs that you got to reposition. If you're going to make a, a display of like a giant water bug, you've got to get those long legs to be out in position too. So it would be great if you were rehydrating one to play with those legs and see if they'll extend to the point that you want them to. That's an excellent question. Excellent question. Were there any others? Again, if any other questions come into the chat, they can certainly let me know at our next question break. Wonderful. Wonderful. So we have our insect safely home. We have our insect rehydrated in our relaxing chamber. And we have our insect safely and successfully pinned to a homemade pinning board. Well, now what? How do we get an insect from the pinning board into a wonderful display box for a permanent display? We let it sit on the pinning board for way longer than you think it should take. With this situation, it's unlike the, re the relaxing chamber, you're not able to go back and check it every so often, not as easily. If I were to pick up the wax paper, the wing might travel back. If it's, if it's not dry enough, the wing might kind of sag back a little bit, and then that would force you to go back in and rehandle it, which has more risk of damaging it. Or especially a partially dried insect, that's like maximum risk of breaking a wing or rubbing scales off or just having it not get into the right position again. So once it's on the board, I like to just leave them for at least a week sometimes more, especially with a really large moth, like a luna moth or a cecropia, I would leave it for over a week and just let it sit and sit and sit. You might see a little bit of crinkling or pinching on the, on the abdomen. That's totally normal, and I don't know of any way to, uh, to keep that from happening. With something like a praying mantis, the abdomen might kind of lose its color and get kind of brown. That's totally normal. There are some really advanced insect collecting techniques for removing the guts from a praying mantis or a stick insect or something, but that's, that's beyond what I've ever attempted. Some folks who collect like weird jungle specimens for the really, really high profile museum collections will do that sort of thing. But you don't have to worry about any of that. Even with a Cecropia or a Luna, that abdomen is so furry and has all those long hairs on them that it pretty much disguises all of that shriveling and crinkling. I've never had a, an abdomen that comes out looking so bad that it really stands out and ruins the, the look of the display. You leave it there for uh, at least a week, uh, maybe longer. And then once you're all set, you can just remove the pins very carefully, remove that waxed paper, remove your antenna pins, and then very gently, because you left a little bit of pin sticking up out of the back, you can grab the pin from the back, and pull it out of your display, and now you've got your insect. Then you need some special housing to put your finished insect in. I really like to use the commercially available shadow boxes from craft stores. They do sell, of course, uh, you know, insect collection boxes and things, but just a plain old deep set picture frame like this from a craft store like a Michaels. I'll bring up our camera a little bit. From a craft store like a Michaels or um, you know any sort of, of artsy crafty store that you have around here. Michaels is just the one that we have here in Western New York. Not sure if you folks have them. And the, they have a, a back, back in here that opens up pretty easily. You can get a little pin. There you go. So the backing comes out. And once you've got it, you can attach to the backing any sort of foam layer or uh, a sort of um, something that the insect pin can sit in more deeply so that the display will be complete and the insect won't fall out of place. The, the backing that comes normally with a shadow box like this is usually too thin. The insect pin won't sink deep enough into it to really house that insect really well. But, of course, you always have the option of 
building a backing all on your own. All I use for my insect backing is some foam, is some uh, felt from the same craft store. And there are sometimes some little flecks and specks and spots on the, the felt that you can remove with a lint roller. And I use a little bit of either cardboard or especially some foam, just some, some nice, thin white foam that you can cut with an X-Acto knife uh, to size. This piece, of course, would be too small for that particular shadow box, but uh, that same craft store should have uh, a backing that has a little bit of depth to it so that that insect pin can sink in to the foam and that insect pin won't fall out as you're moving the display around. And then, of course, over top of the foam because it's white, and I really like a dark black backing to my displays because it makes the insect colors really pop and get really dynamic. You can just cover it up with some felt. And there's your backing that has the nice felt look and then the nice foam depth for the pin. Once you have your shadow box all assembled, of course, then the problem becomes keeping it safe from those same dermestids and mold that we were talking about earlier. With my shadow boxes, I really like to put some cedar chips and cedar oil inside. The, the cedar is a fantastic natural insect repellent and insecticide. It keeps insect eggs from hatching. It keeps larvae from even surviving. It can kill the larva but it also keeps them from, uh, from finding your insects and getting into trouble there. And I will also put in some little um, chemical desiccant packets. Now those are the, the little packages that look like uh, salt and pepper packs that come in, in boxes of shoes that say do not eat. That's because they're, those, they're these little silica pellets that uh, absorb water. It will decrease the humidity inside your shadow box so much that no mold or fungus is going to want to grow. And that's a crucial, crucial uh, protection that you'll have because over the years, as your educational display is sitting in your nature center or sitting in your home, it's going to be exposed to fungal spores. It's just a guarantee. There's no way to seal this up tight enough to keep out those wonderful teeny tiny microscopic fungal spores. So keeping that indoor, inside climate really controlled and protected from fungus is going to be absolutely crucial. And the best way to do that is with those silica packets. They're available in the hundreds for a very, very cheap online. You can look on Amazon and buy a big old packet of them. Some of them can even be, be reused. You can put the packet right in a microwave and it will rehydrate, well, it will dehydrate once again and you can uh, put it right back in your insect display for another round. Were there any questions about shadow boxes or insect displays? Before we get moving along. Oh, where do you get cedar oil? The cedar oil is, uh, again, available online. I get mine from Amazon. It's usually sold as a, as, um, a woodworking oil. It's used to, to bring out the, um, it's used to bring out the, the, the scent and the insect repellent properties in cedar, like a cedar chest or a cedar closet. Yeah. Uh, so if, if there are any, uh, you know, sometimes there'll be a woodworking store or uh, a, a craft store in general that will be, um, that will offer some uh, cedar oil or the cedar wood chips. They sell little sachets, little packets of cedar chips, which of course contain the oil. If you really want to go crazy, you can buy the packet of cedar chips and drip some cedar oil on them so that it absorbs like a marshmallow all of that oil and will slowly release the, the oil into the controlled environment of the shadow box over years. Of course, then you have a giant pack of cedar chips in your display, and that might be kind of distracting, but it will not have any sort of bug 
critters growing in it, that's for, for sure. Where do you steal the silica packets? Beef jerky. Well, that would work. It would make your bugs smell really great. Um, but yeah, like I, like I mentioned, I might have been before that I got to the, um, the part about getting silica packets online. I don't really see any sort of consistent pattern with what kinds of companies or what kinds of retailers offer silica packets. They're mostly just kind of sold by giant wholesale companies as like a, a huge um, item with hundreds and hundreds of packets all at once. Let's see. Okay. Oh, what was the part about microwaving the silica? Yeah, that's, that's an adventure. Some of the silica packets will uh, change colors as they absorb water and they'll become, um, they, some of them turn blue or they start blue and turn white. And that just tells you how far along the rehydration process that the silica packet is. So once the silica packet turns a certain color, you know that it's 100% absorbed as much water as it can. And then you can take it out of the insect display just by opening up the back very, very carefully. And then popping those silica packets into your microwave, microwaving it for the amount of time that they recommend. It'll say right on the packet. Um, and then that microwave action will evaporate all of the water inside the silica beads and then it'll be good for another round and keep in mind that not every packet of silica beads is going to be able to do that it, you'll know absolutely right away because every packet that is able to do this um, always advertises it as one of their top selling points of the the product because they're reusable but then again they're so super cheap that i use both the usable and the non-usable ones it's, um, it, it makes no difference. They both do the same job. And at the end of the day, it might cost exactly the same because the, the reusable ones will be a little bit more expensive in the end. But of course, you know, reusing uh, things and not chucking away those silica uh, packets would be absolutely fantastic. Keep them out of the landfill. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specimens to show that were super desiccated when you found them? I did not bring any with me today, but this is being recorded here and I have the contact information for the folks who can uh, get some photos to you if, if you like. Um, essentially, they look exactly the same as our fresh moth here, they want, it's actually pretty surprising. It, once they rehydrate, they are pretty much exactly the same. Um, they look exactly the same as a, as a fresh insect. They are um, completely uh, malleable. The, you know, they'll, they won't be quite as malleable as a fresh insect, but they will, uh, that once they're finished, they'll be exactly, exactly the same appearance, which is the whole, that's the whole uh, attractiveness for this technique for me, because you can take such a, such a shriveled bug and turn it into something that looks just like this. That's why I was so comfortable using a fresh bug today. Even though this individual bug wasn't rehydrated, it's exactly the same process for a fresh bug, because once it's rehydrated, it behaves exactly the same way. Are there any collecting laws to be aware of? As far as um, numbers of insects that, be, that can be collected or uh, locations that can be collected from, there are no restrictions of that kind. There are just a very, very few protected or endangered insects in New York State. So I would definitely and always be sure of what you have uh, before you collect it alive. Certainly, if the insect is found dead, I think that could be a more interesting uh, legal question. I won't give any advice on that because I'm not exactly sure of the answer, but boy, if I found like a Carner blue butterfly or a, a frosted elfin butterfly, I would be really, really interested, if, if I found it dead, I would be really, really interested personally in preserving it as a, a specimen, an educational specimen. Um, yeah, I will do some more research on that. I'm surprised that I have never really, um, because I live in Western New York and there are 
no endangered, especially butterflies and moths out here. Um, I have never really closely looked into any sort of um, laws concerning possessing an endangered insect as an educational specimen. That is a very, very good question. But yeah, if you're considering, you know, collecting moths from, from a light on your porch, or if you're collecting, um, you know, dead insects that you find around your house or in your car all shriveled up, um, I would definitely recommend just being sure of what you have before you start handling it and moving it around from place to place. Of course, the other concern besides protected and endangered species are extremely invasive species. Sometimes even moving a dead emerald ash borer can be a violation of certain environmental conservation laws. So anytime that I've ever dealt with emerald ash borer specimens, I've always prepared them as specimens right where I found them. So for example, at Reinstein Woods Nature Preserve or at, uh, at other nature preserves or nature centers like Chip Holt Nature Center in, in Lakeville. Um, I've always preserved an emerald ash borer exactly where I found it. I've never driven it from place to place even after it's dead, just because it's, that can be considered um, legally treacherous. And you never know, it might wake up and fly away on you. Not likely. Were there any other questions? insect collecting in general. We're getting to a, a really great uh, season for insect collecting because there are so many different kinds of insects active now at all different kinds of phases of their lives. So of course it's easiest to preserve the adult insects like this adult moth here, but the, the rehydration technique will certainly work on uh, fuzzier caterpillars that you might find uh, because they they won't shrivel up like you know like like this type of a moth is a geometer moth and it's its caterpillar is a tiny little hairless inchworm so it would shrivel up into a tiny little raisin and it would pretty much be destroyed I wouldn't even attempt to to rehydrate something like that but something like a hickory tussock moth or a giant leopard moth caterpillar if you put that in the relaxing chamber, it will eventually become relaxed enough that you could uncurl it if it was all curled up. Or if you just found it in the, in the wild dead, I would definitely recommend um, putting it in the relaxing chamber, not to reposition it, but just to purge it of all of the, the fungus and nasty stuff that might be in it. That vinegar solution is going to kill or seriously inconvenience any sort of fungus or insect that might be living inside there. Um, yeah, it can be a challenge to try to preserve um, insects at different life uh, phases, but keep experimenting. That's how I figured all this, all this stuff out. Have you ever collected aquatic larval or nymph stages of insects like dragonflies and stoneflies? I have collected them in the past. They don't tend to preserve quite as well as terrestrial insects because of course they're so um, saturated with water that once they dry out their abdomens especially tend to shrivel way down into that horrible raisin looking thing. But there are different techniques that I have messed around with a very little bit, but uh, not that much. You can certainly uh, look at some, some YouTube ways to do this of uh, preserving them in a vial of alcohol or a vial of a hydrogen peroxide, a totally chemically, um, you know, a, a chemical that will, that will completely eliminate any sort of fungus or uh, little decomposing insects that will keep it as a, a wet specimen. If you've seen anybody with a, a wet specimen collection before, they're really, really, crazy and they look like like a Frankenstein-y sort of vibe because there are a bunch of little vials and you bring them out and they have little um, dragonfly nymphs or stoneflies or mayflies or something. So that would be a challenge. That's something that I'm kind of uh, interested in generally. I haven't really messed around with it that much. Um, but yeah, if you have an interest, you can certainly um, pop onto YouTube and see what's available or, um, you know, what, what I did for the couple of dragonfly and um, the, the young dragonfly nymphs that I that I got, I just 
filled up a little vial with some uh, rubbing alcohol, popped the nymph in there, and twisted on the lid really, really tight, and it's been good for many years. Any other questions? Well, there can also be some um, some question as to where to get the best uh, insect pins or you know how big or what kind or anything. So these are commercially available insect pins from a, an insect um, collection retailer online. You don't need to use this kind of pin, any sort of, of, um, of stainless uh, pin or needle will do. You want it to be stainless so it doesn't start to rust and start to, uh, to build up some little um, films or inconvenient um, you know, complications, especially on the inside of your insect, especially after years. They can um, you could use, um, you know, sewing needles, you could use, um, you know, uh, any sort of, of pin, you could even cut off the end of a safety pin if you wanted to. But um, these insect pins are pretty handy because they have a, a tiny little head on the end. And the head is really handy for, for handling the pin. Yeah, I don't know, that's probably not going to show too well. But of course, the pin has a little flat head. I never liked the um, the big round ball on the end of the pin because I thought that was kind of distracting. It kind of got in the way of the insect's body. It looks like, oh, what's that in the way? Is that part of the insect? Is it not? So I like as small a pin as possible. And if the pin is silver like this, I'll go in with a Sharpie and I'll color in the top of the head so that it looks dark and doesn't shine too much and distract from the, the insect. Speaking of pins, uh, do you label your insects and how do you do it? What info do you put on it? That is a crucial question. I'm so glad you asked that. I was not even going to mention that today, but I am so, so happy that you brought that up. Oh, it's Bina Nagel. Hi, Bina. They, um, many insect collectors will put a tiny little tag on the pin itself on the underneath the insect um, and they'll just slide it onto the pin. It'll have like a scientific name of the insect and uh, coordinates of where it was found. Unless you're working for Cornell, that won't really be necessary. What I do and to, to keep those insect labels out of my displays, which I like to look really, really pretty and artistic, I like them to, um, I'll either put numbers or numbered uh, labels on the pins or underneath the insects. And then I will have a sheet or a list that's either stored on a, on a computer or printed out and taped to the back of the insect display that has the, uh, the insects. Common name is fine. Sometimes I'll throw in a scientific name just for fun because sometimes common names will change or be ambiguous with something else. And I always just put the name of the town where I collected it. And, you know, besides being kind of scientifically satisfying to do, it could also make your collection or your specimen scientifically relevant in the future. Sometimes, for some reason, some weird bug becomes scientifically relevant in, for an unforeseen reason. Maybe suddenly there's a massive die-off of black swallowtails, and they want to know you know, the, and they get some sort of information through, you know, that, that Cornell or some huge research institution gets some kind of information that, oh, the black swallowtails from the Genesee Valley in the Genesee region were resistant to whatever fungus or something that was killing them off. They need access to specimens that were collected in that region. And sometimes that sort of uh, research and information will become available at an inconvenient time, like the fall or the beginning of the winter, where those specimens won't really be available. So having on hand uh, different specimens that have just the information on the general region where they were collected and a common name or a scientific name can be really useful, besides being fun to just have on hand. 
oh, do you have an insect identification guide that you recommend? Absolutely. The uh, Kaufman Insect Guide to the, in, or it's, uh, the Kaufman Field Guide to the Insects of North America. It is absolutely incredible. Of course, it can't be comprehensive because there are so many thousands and thousands of species of insects, but it will give you an excellent, excellent starting point for certainly the orders and probably the families of most insects that you're likely to encounter in North America. And they do a great job. They, they actually do get into both East Coast and Rocky Mountains and West Coast. It's absolutely incredible the amount of information they're able to pack into this field guide. It's well illustrated. It has, um, you know, short comprehensive or, you know, short con uh, condensed uh, entries for many different kinds of insects. It has a lot of information about their, um, their life histories as well. If there's any, you know, it's not just about diagnostics or, um, you know, or impact to agriculture as some other field guides are, it's, it has quite a bit about life histories too. Like there's um, some parasitic wasps and things that have just completely fascinating life histories that you know, aren't super relevant as far as we know to, um, to agriculture or medicine or any sort of human activity, but boy, they're interesting to uh, bug nerds like us. So if you were ever to uh, come across like um, you know a certain uh, diving beetle or some sort of obscure uh, subset of ladybug they they'll have an entry in there for you so they will give you a starting point of you know what this thing is and what it does and what it gets up to excellent question i'll put actually right now i'll see if i can find a a good link to it right here yeah Hey, Conrad, while you're looking yep. for that link, I do just want to give you a heads up that we're approaching 10 to 1. Um, I'm not sure if we're nearing the end of your demonstration, um, but just in case you don't have a clock available, I just wanted to let you know. Yes, I am right at the end of my demonstration. Once I pop that link in there for you so everyone can see it, I am all set and clear to, clear to exit. Excellent. You're doing a great job with the questions. Oh, I love them. That's why I'm here. Kaufman. Yeah, Kaufman has all kinds of fantastic field guides out there in general, but boy, this one's great. I, you know, because I'm a mega dork, I'm trying to read the thing cover to cover. Just because, and you know, it, it helps, you know, being an English major, it helps that they have some color and character to their entries too. They actually, they seemed at least to enjoy the, um, the writing process as well. And with that, I am, I got to everything that I wanted to get to. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me, putting my email in there. Thank you all so much for joining me and thank you Allegheny Nature Pilgrimage for hosting me. It's been such an honor to be a part of the Allegheny Nature Pilgrimage as a presenter the 62nd annual. It's been going on for 60 years. And they had to do it virtual this year. We're strange times we live in. But thank you very, very much for letting me be a part of it. Conrad, you're so welcome. And thank you to everyone uh, that joined us today. Uh, that was an excellent presentation um, and demonstration that you showed us. And we would love to see you in person next year for ANP 2021. Um, we do have a couple more programs today. We're about halfway through the Sunday programs. Um, up next, we're going to be hearing um, about frogs and then some digital wildlife photography, a fungi walk, um, birding adventure, and also some pollinators later this evening at 7 p.m. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, everything is being recorded and also streamed and posted to Facebook. So if you enjoyed this and want to watch it over and over again uh, or share with some friends and family, uh, feel free. Uh, thank you, everyone. Take care.